Cool. So as you might have seen on the on the Zoom um, invite, we're talking about sugar a little bit today and how that impacts long COVID. And, and you know, generally all of us, um, you know, these principles don't just apply to us when we're sick. They they also apply to us when we're, you know, healthy. And I think, you know, this still is like this big misconception in food anyway. We're trying to get away from like fat being the enemy, but it's it's all sugar. Um, which drives the most inflammation, weight gain in us compared to what's traditionally drive, um, promoted as being fat. So um, we're going to go through a couple of concepts today, like related to that and, you know, how that applies to long COVID people as well. Um, so, and we're going to talk about, you know, two areas specifically. So that being autonomic dysfunction which is quite a common thing that long COVID or post-vaccine reaction illness um, patients are experiencing. So they typically get this like very random onset of autonomic type symptoms, which is all to do with things like heart rate, controlling respiratory rate, control of temperature. So things you'll experience with this is like um, cold intolerance, not regulating your temperature very well. You get palpitations shortness of breath, um, panicky type symptoms. Um, so we're going to talk about how you know sugar relates to that and how sugar can really perpetuate that and sort of lead on to triggering some of these types of symptoms. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about mitochondrial dysfunction, which is, an, is another big mechanism in how um, long COVID essentially manifests. So first off, you know, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about what, you know, typically happens in the body when we eat sugar you know and this is you know typically refined um re re refined sugar which causes a very quick spike in our blood sugar so you know candy chocolate sweets um very and also like a lot of these white type foods so like rice pasta bread which have become like very sort of mainstay in our staple diets in this modern era they're all they all break down very quickly into our bloodstream. So it releases a huge dump of sugar into our bloodstream. So it's, it's not just sugar. It can be what we call like high GI foods. Um, and that's typically these white types of foods. They, they break down very quickly, release the, glu release the glucose into our bloodstream much quicker than whole foods or high fiber foods, um, which causes the same effect. So. You know, when, when this happens, when we eat these types of foods, we get a very quick spike in our blood sugar. And that essentially is, is very toxic and actually damaging for our body. And it's dangerous for our body. And our body recognizes this, right? So it recognizes the blood sugar has gone up. So what it will do is it will release a ton of insulin to combat that. And insulin is going to take the sugar from our blood and pump it into our cells for it to be used for our cells to produce energy. And this is where sometimes the misconception comes from, I think, when we think about sugar, we think about and it's good for our energy, gives us energy. And we'll touch upon a little bit why it's actually not very good for our energy and not very efficient for energy production um, when that happens, which will come more to the mitochondrial thing. But essentially our body wants to get the, the high blood sugar down, so it'll, it'll release insulin to do that, to get it into our cells to get it out, get out the blood. Now, what happens is when we, we get this like big spike of blood sugar and therefore big release of insulin, we get this overshoot of um, the blood sugar going actually further down. So we get like a hypo. Instead of like being maintained in neutral, which is where, you know, where things are in balance, we get actually an overshoot completely past that. So it dips right down. And this is the typical thing is like people will have like the start off the day with a bowl of cereal or toast with some jam. Uh, one of these like high GI sugary things, which causes this spike um, in the morning and then drop down by like 10 a.m. And they're craving sugar again, craving chocolate and snacks to keep them going, which again, it, it repeats this whole process that spikes it up which then overshoots, drops down. So you get this yo-yoing effect through the day and what we call like a blood sugar roller coaster. Um, and, you know, so that's like normal circumstance. And what we see with, you know, long COVID, the long COVID population is that they just don't regulate very well. So it becomes even more of an issue. So, you know, 
our body this is all about regulation our body regulation essentially means maintaining homeostasis or maintaining balance um and it means like so when we see things go up it the body's regulating to bring it back down to normal so there's a lot of things that need to happen for that process to happen and we see with the long COVID population is they don't regulate well so it's more likely that they're not going to be able to deal so well with the peaks and troughs of the high sugar or, or low sugar um, and therefore causes more damage so you know when we get this high insulin we're probably less likely to be able to get the sugar out the blood and into the cell and this is what we're starting to see through the research is that you know, post COVID and long COVID is more likely that we can develop like diabetes and things like this. Because what we know about inflammation is it decreases our sensitivity to insulin. So if you're getting lots of inflammation in the body, that can actually lead to and contribute to diabetes. Um, so it's not sometimes it's it's not just the sugar. We need to think about what's causing inflammation in the body. And then on the other end of the spectrum is, you know, when we get this trough in the blood sugar you know this is where we get this hypo and we feel jittery and anxious and get moody um and it typically you know this releases a lot of adrenaline so when we get this trough we get an adrenaline release um because the basically our um our, our, our adrenals are trying to maintain um energy production trying to boost this back up um um to maintain the balance at point again so it can really drive adrenaline as if we get that adrenaline release it's going to really trigger again like these palpitations this shortness of breath anxiety and all the sort of symptoms that we tend to get through this long covid phenomenon so the more you can get away from these high sugar high gi foods and start getting more into you know normal whole foods um with minimal like you know i think it's a good point to avoid like things like tropical foods tropical fruits mangoes bananas these more high gi fruits that are typically higher in natural sugars and try and steer more towards like veg lean protein and fats especially fats are going to be able to help you maintain a more stable blood sugar rhythm through the day and therefore help with your energy production so you know when we actually look at what you, you, what like we said like it can be damaging high blood sugar for the body and there's particularly a few parts of the body which are very sensitive to that so the thyroid is one thing that is very sensitive to blood sugar and and that's one thing you know we see a lot of long covid patients is that underactive thyroid is quite common and that's probably related to all the inflammation going on um but adding sugar on top of that adds another strain to that system uh, again, the brainstem. So the brainstem is essentially the main thing that's um, responsible for regulating autonomic function. So respiratory, um, cardiac function, um, regulating temperature. And when we get high levels of insulin and high blood sugar, that can actually damage the, the brainstem and, and those sort of areas, which therefore causes more and more issues. Uh, and, and there's just the nervous system in general. So one of the main uh, complications of diabetes you'll find is actually they go blind, which is one of the one of the more the one of the first sort of more comp one of the first complications that happens. They tend to lose their eyesight, and that's because the sugar is being dumped into the um, the uh, optic nerve and damages the nerve, um, and therefore leads to 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 eyesight problems and blindness and again like peripheral neuropathy they get a lot of um um, um it's like sciatica and stuff and that's again because the nervous system is quite sensitive can be damaged to but damaged by sugar um so you know getting away from sugar can be quite a, a useful thing in inhibiting some of these like random onsets of palpitations and you know we we often can think that art oh, is completely random but often once you start like removing the sugar removing these things and putting extra stress on the system you'll start to find out that actually some of them are playing a role in triggering the onset of this stuff um and the more we can do that the more we get more into like a balanced position where our body can actually recover and heal when we're eating lots of sugar we're getting tons of like cortisol releases um sympathetic activation 
um, in this stress response that we typically get with this peaks and troughs with the blood sugar, the less we're going to be in that position in our nervous system where healing can take place, which is our parasympathetic. So we're going to talk a little bit more about mitochondrial function and how sugar really in like can be damaging to that. So if you don't know already, you know, the mitochondria are, are things that produce energy in the body. So they're a small thing that looks like this um, sits in the cell and this is where we produce energy. So the cell uses produce energy so it can do everything it needs to do. So what happens is when we eat sugar is or eat any food is, you know, that we get um, nutrients, fats, proteins or carbohydrate can be absorbed into the mitochondria for it to convert that into ATP or energy. Now, what happens is with with sugar, especially when we get like this high spike in sugar is, again, we, we said that insulin will drive this into the cell. So it's almost like flooding your car engine. Um, yeah, well, so like when we, like we mentioned, if you get this spike in blood sugar here, it drives it into the cell and it's almost like flooding the car engine with, with fuel. You get this soot and smoke. Um, so essentially um, that causes damage to the mitochondria. Um, so if we get like this huge surge of sugar into the, the mitochondria, it overwhelms it and causes this damaging effect. Um, so it's not actually useful for our energy production. It produces more collateral damage actually in its in its conversion into energy. So it's it can it basically burns quite dirty. It, and that's why fats tend to be more cleaner at producing energy. They don't get so much of what we call free radical production. When we get sugar, we're very sugar dependent, and we get this whole these large surges of sugar being pumped into the cell we get a lot of what we call free radical formation, which is essentially um, in, the, in the production of energy, you get this, this release in unstable um, elements or unstable molecules, which react with other parts of the cell. Um, and that can lead to like DNA and cellular damage, which leads to a breakdown and, and like a destruction of the mitochondria. And what we know, what we can see is actually when mitochondrial sort of like breakdown on the cell gets damaged, we get this um, a release of some of the contents of the cell into the bloodstream. And that can really trigger the immune system again, um, because essentially our DNA and our mitochondria shouldn't really be in the blood. It shouldn't be there. So when our immune system sees that, it can it reacts because um, it, it's like a danger signal. So it can really so we, you know. The sugar and the, the free radical formation from that uh, destroys and breaks and damages our mitochondria. So that in produces more fatigue. We don't, we're not, we haven't got as much for, um, mitochondria to produce energy, and it can also produce more inflammation. So essentially, you know, our body knows this. Our body knows that you know the there's a lot of this free radical formation typically in the mitochondria um that's just part of the process it happens more when we eat more like high gi foods and more um refined sugar uh, but it does happen to a certain certain extent anyway and it will have antioxidant systems to deal with that so one of our main ones being glutathione is essentially needed in this step to prevent it contains this free radical formation. It will basically mop up the free radicals. That's exactly what antioxidants are. So we all heard of antioxidants in, you know, colorful fruits, raspberries, blueberries. Um, this is exactly what they do. They mop up and counteract the free radical. So they, the radical is like an, an oxidant. It oxidizes things, whereas this is an antioxidant. It, it counteracts that. So it basically contains this and stops this process from happening. Um, so I think the main thing to, you know, this is a fairly brief sort of like touch upon sugar, but um, I think that the main thing for long COVID, the long COVID population is a lot of them are, you know, whether that's through the vaccine or like infection is they're very much looking, seeing this is like, you know, I was healthy and I'm looking for a cure to fix me. Um, instead of 
which is, you know, we're going to unpick like long COVID, especially like the vaccine over time with what it's doing to interact with the body. Um, but it's more than that. It's basically how that is interacting with our own physiology. And it seems to be that certain people have physiological traits which are making them interact negatively with that inflammatory trigger. So one of the big things for COVID-19 is this antioxidant factor again. So if we don't have enough antioxidants to deal with the inflammation that comes from the infection or possibly vaccine, we don't get a contain containment of the free radicals. We get more inflammation, which causes more damage to more cells, which causes more activation of the, of the immune system again. And we get this, what, what we've all heard, this cytokine storm. So it's likely, you know, a lot of the lifestyle things are catching up with many of us. So, you know, whether that's through eating too much sugar or toxins or other things which are draining our antioxidants in the first place. We therefore don't have the capacity to deal with the extra inflammatory stress or strain being the infection or vaccine. Um, so this is, you know, when we talk about recovering from long COVID, it's essentially less about finding the silver bullet cure and more about creating an environment for that's, that supports your body to recover. Um, and it's easy to understand why a lot of people have gone down this route in because it's been a very sort of acute and quite uh, shockingly like quick change from being considered generally healthy and to being you know significantly ill so a lot of a lot of people are looking for the cure to fix them and they haven't changed the mindset into being actually recovering from chronic illness is is less about this stuff you know i don't know one chronic illness that has like a medication or a cure that helps people to really you know have a curative effect you get medication to help and support people and like suppress the symptoms so if you have like hypothyroidism you'll get thyroid replacement therapy to give you enough thyroid thyroid hormone so you can function normally if you have high blood pressure you'll get blood pressure medication to suppress your blood pressure artificially so it's they're all things that aren't they're not curative but they they help us to keep stable and just keep things under control and that's different from a cure. You know, there's still all the causes for this; these diseases are still um, existing. So, when we a lot, of, this is why people find functional medicine is that they realise that even though they have those things in place and things are under control, they still don't feel well, and they're still not functioning optimally. They're still low energy. They're not thriving, and they start to realise it's actually they need to. They need to heal it themselves, essentially, rather than finding the silver bullet. Um, so sugar is essentially one important factor in that, removing the things that are keeping us in an inflammatory state, which are contributing to the inflammation, contributing to immune imbalance and dysfunction. And that's really where our body can start accessing, accessing this parasympathetic zone and start recovering. Because, our, you know, that's essentially what our body is designed to do. It's always designed to come back to that balance point. The same with, you know, blood sugar going up. It's designed to deal with that and bring it back to normal. And that's exactly the same when we're sick. You know, it will rebalance and reheal and regenerate if we remove the obstacles to that. So sugar can be one thing that can, can inhibit returning to that balance point. Um, so yeah, I think all you guys are on this anyway, but I was going to mention if anyone wants to keep coming, you can sign up to the newsletter. Um, and we'll do like Kirsty will do a meditation for us next week. Um, and I'll do another one of these in two weeks time. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how long it was. It felt quite quick, but, um, if you have any questions, then we can open that up. Um, yeah. Hi, Doctor. Hi, Josie. Uh, Josie. Hi. Um, how, do you, how do you increase uh, glutathione in the body? 
Yeah, good question. Um, so, you know, there's sort of a few basic things like there's if you you know, what's been shown by research is that sleep has a massive effect on antioxidants and glutathione production. So if you're not sleeping, you don't produce enough melatonin that has a direct impact on your glutathione status. So a lot of these simple things can have a big impact on that. And I think the tendency for a lot of people is to skip over those and go into supplementing glutathione or supplementing the precursors to that. So NAC is one thing. Um, you've also got, you need protein for producing glutathione. Um, it comes from amino acid um, absorption. Um, and then you have something called the transsulfuration pathway in the body. Um, so sulfur foods can be very important for producing glutathione. So the sulfur foods are like cruciferous vegetables. Um, your broccoli, your cabbage. So a lot of these veg, getting that into the diet can be quite helpful. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, the NAC I heard, uh, just, you can't, uh, it doesn't absorb or something to produce the glutathione is not as effective. Is that right? Yeah, I think you can get, you know, it, it's going to vary on the quality of the product. Um, yeah, there, there is a debate on how absorbable, absorbable it is. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still quite widespreadly used, it's used quite widespread. So it seems to ha help that whole process for sure. Um, but in my experience, I think it's more effective in, you know, the body produces glutathione on its own. So I think it's a lot of people fall in the trap of, of supplementing or supplementing NAC and without questioning why the glutathione is being being um, drained from the body. Um, otherwise, you're in this continual system of um, keeping it uh, sustained, trying to supplement it, but not finding out the reason why it's low, because our body produces glutathione. So it might be sleep for some people, it might be just low to stress. It's generally inflammation. What's Inflammation will produce these free radicals, and that drains the glutathione. So when we look at inflammation, it could be stress, it could be um, microbial things, gut imbalances, chronic infections, it could be food sensitivity, it could be um, toxins. Uh, that's generally the four areas you'll find inflammation will come from. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. No problem.